So it looks like we are now live. Oh, yes. hi. <laughs> well, thanks so much to everyone for joining us both in person here at the Siena Art Institute and also for people who will be joining us online. We'll wait just a few moments to let our online viewers see the notification and log in to join us. Um, but just as we're waiting for our online viewers to, to join in, um, I'll just mention that um, tonight's, um, tonight's event uh, is um, part of our ongoing initiative um, called Starters Asajigarte. And this is a series of conversations that we'll have continuing during this fall semester. Uh, so at the same time next Tuesday, do come back. Uh, we'll have Hanan um, Kai, who is here from the same time on Tuesday. Um, and yes. so our online viewers are able to join us both through our Facebook page and the YouTube channel. Um, so we can see some people starting to join in. So a welcome to our online viewers as well. Um, I'll just mention both to our in-person audience and also our online viewers, we really welcome um, questions or comments and we'll save some time at the end of the presentation uh, for uh, the Q&A. So please you know, feel free to, to share your very much welcome. Um, I'll give a, a brief introduction. Yeah, please come on again. Dr. Professor of Visual Studies at Temple University's Tyler School of Arts and Architecture in Philadelphia in the U.S. Uh, she's an artist and scholar with transdisciplinary engagements informed by fine arts, art history, critical geography, urban studies, and politics. Um, her projects are engendered by and respond to the history of the avant-garde and its relationship to political critique. Um, as well as feminist art and writing, social dissent, the histories of photography, performance, and reenactment as political strategy, and the pernicious effects of neoliberal capitalism. The center of her art and writing is a focus on the myriad ways individuals' freedom of expression is destroyed, curtailed, or displaced through socioeconomic factors beyond their control. Uh, her visual work has been exhibited in many galleries and museums, including the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts Museum in Philadelphia, the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in San Francisco, Art in Waterville, Maine, the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia in Halifax, and the Museum of Contemporary Canadian Art in Toronto. Her critical writing can be found in academic journals and contemporary art magazines, such as Mapping Mini, The Journal, um, Anarchist Studies, Prefix Photo, Art Criticism, Criticism and C Magazine. Uh, her book, Engendering and Avant-Garde, The Unsettled Landscapes of Vancouver Photo Conceptualism, um, came out in 2018. And her second book, The Counter uh, Revengeous Art um, in the Global City, will be published coming up in 2023. So, Keep your eyes out for that one. So, um, yeah, as, again, as we're getting started with our presentation, I'll just reiterate to our online viewers who are joining us. First of all, welcome. We really appreciate having um, the online audience as well. So do feel free to leave comments or questions um, during this live stream, and we'll save some time uh, during the second part of the talk for, for a QA. and a But without further ado, I will turn the stage over to Dr. Liam Modillan. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks for that wonderful introduction. And it, it literally was a dream for a long time for me to come to this city in particular and spend more than two days here. So mm -hmm. I feel really mm -hmm. <laughs> lucky. Time for me. Um, Let me just yeah. you really quickly. Okay. There seems to be the connection thing, so I'm just gonna. This does a better job. Okay. I'll do the same here. 
see. Tell me when I should continue. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Sorry, guys, for the technical glitches. All right, so it looks like we, we are back online. Okay. All right. Can you, Lisa, can you just show me how to uh, put yes. this back on the screen? Yeah. Sorry about that. No, it's okay. I'm used to my Mac, so. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, right. So I thought that I would uh, just discuss some of the work I've been doing over more recent years in relationship to what I've been um, thinking about and working on while I've been here. And um, this is mostly going to be a talk about my art, not my writing, just so everyone knows, although the, the themes in both uh, inform each other for sure. So some of the things you can sort of look for as I'm talking, I've listed here, but these are sort of themes or interests that seem to populate all of the creative work that I do. And those are include really an interest in archives um, and in sort of digging through archives and looking for information um, and, and very often looking at uh, photographs in archives. So I, some of the work that you're going to see is constructed out of pictures that I've collected and had scanned from various historical archives. Um, there's a, there seems to be a, a continuous thread uh, having to do with the, with the interactions of space, of people in space in cities. And so um, this notion of urban space and its relationship to um, fields like critical geography and urban studies is another interest, and that's really informing the recent uh, writing, the book that I've been working on. Um, as it says, there are also the history of photography. So not only looking at photographs and archives, but thinking about how the history of photography informs how we think about contemporary art and visual culture since essential, essentially its invention um, in the 1800s. And... I was really trained in very conceptually oriented art schools. So Concordia University in Montreal as an undergraduate and later the San Francisco Art Institute. Um, and so in part because of those exposures and because of my own kind of academic interests, conceptual art and specifically conceptual art that uses language and um, the photographic image has also really informed a lot of the work that I do. Um, so th 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 those will probably pop up in the talk, some of those references. And um, the history of conceptual art emerged, you know, in the 1960s out of a longer history of avant-garde art practice that was critical of sort of ideologies and, and, and dynamics of power. And so by nature, I'm also interested really in that kind of art history, a history of the avant-garde and its relationship to political critique. Um, and lastly, um, while I'm, I'm talking more about sort of, uh, vi you know, photographs and visual culture oriented stuff today and archival work, the, I was really trained as a sculptor. So I'm always kind of approaching my artwork from a sp what I call a spatial perspective. <laughs> so I really do think about the ways that a viewer engages with artwork in a physical place, how their body may be interacting with the work around them and how um, the art, uh, the art's meaning changes in different types of times and periods, depending on the position of the viewer. So these are all kinds of things that inform how I think about my work. So super briefly, um, as Lisa said, I, I have, uh, I also work as an art historian and this is a book I published a few years ago, four years ago, Engendering an Avant-Garde, which um, as the subtitle says, the unsettled, unsettled landscapes of Vancouver photoconceptualism was a study of the discourses of the avant-garde that supported certain artists work in the city of Vancouver where I'm originally from. So uh, this book talks a lot about um, the, the well-known international photographer, Jeff Wall and Ian Wallace and um, other people in Vancouver, basically, or whose work was really important to um, the development of contemporary art in Vancouver. Um, as the other just little uh, picture shows, I've, I'm also interested in, uh, again, because of the way the viewer interacts in space and the ways that we encounter politics um, and, and all kinds of social meaning through our physical interactions with things, I've become more and more interested in uh, reenactment as um, 
as performance studies theorists have started to think about it in the ways that the kinds of repetitive gestures that people do, especially in things like political protest, how those repetitive sort of reenactments or um, in the body of writing that I read, it's, it's called repertoires, how repertoires of action um, create sort of links between past, present and future um, political um, embodiments, if you will. So these are other kinds of things I'm engaged with. The new book, Counter Revengeist Art in the Global City, is um, an analysis of artworks that uh, literally function as barricades or blockades in different cities around the world. So these are artists um, who, I shall just skip ahead, these are some of the works that I'm talking about in the chapters of the book. Artists um, like Lin Yu Lin, who in southern China in 1995 did this piece called Safely Maneuvering Across Lin Ha Road, which is a cinder block wall that he, um, over 90 minutes, he built on one side of the street and it slowly sort of migrates across to the other side of the street. Um, and so all of these works um, by different artists in different cities, I'm also talking about Mexico City and Bristol, UK and uh, Wellington, New Zealand um, and um, Kiev, actually, um, Ukraine. These actions have to do with like closing down space in order really to create a movement somewhere else. So I'm really interested in this idea of blockades or barricades in public space, um, working not only to shut down space, but actually to redirect attention somewhere else or to redirect movement somewhere else. Um, and the ways that these images of blockades or barricades function as, um, as I was saying before, as repertoires or sort of reenactments of understood methods of um, of sort of enacting dissent in the in the urban realm. So prior to working on sort of more photographic oriented things, I did this series of us. Uh, I made a series of sculptures over many years that are uh, physical reenactments of photographs that I had found in various archives, and so. These sculptures themselves, and if I go ahead, you'll see the sculptures are the result of a reenactment of a photograph that I found through literally what so what I was doing is literally going through hundreds and hundreds of photographs of sort of, of scenes of protest, basically. And I was looking for things that were that were actually three dimensional. I was looking for things that sort of demarcated a space of free speech or a space of political protest for somebody who wasn't necessarily self-identifying as an artist, but was making something physical in order to transform the space in some way and to, to get people to engage with the space in a different way. And um, so it's really attuned for looking at the spatial relations within the photograph. So here on the left is a, uh, at the top left is a, um, a large object. It's a little bit hard to see in the photographs, but it, it's a cardboard tank that was sent by the American Students Union um, in the in the late 19, 1939 to uh, President Roosevelt as a um, a method of asking for him not to get involved in the Second World War, basically. And I think just so interesting. This is literally being what you see there is is this large tank created being delivered to the White House on the back of a postal truck, which is just amazing to think about today that this could ever even have happened, you know? So I, so I remade this now lost object um, and just go back along with other kinds of objects like this in a way to sort of purposefully test out what um, the differences in labor are between, you know, my work as an artist creating something that is very purposefully at a kind of museum scale that's all of these objects were crafted out of uh, archival materials. So, you know, they, they will last a long time and they're crafted in this sort of art world context that is extremely different from how the original object was made. And so the, oops, excuse me, the, the, the work is sort of posing questions about this, this work towards um, creating certain types of spaces and this work to sort of enlivening, you know, a political act that is very, very different and um, in, you know, um, in, con in, in sort of contrast with each other in certain ways. 
um, just to pose questions about what that is and to pose questions about how we understand a photograph that has to do with politics um, in the present, right? So, uh, uh, well, this one has to do with Rome. This is a reenactment of a, um, well, I should say too, these were all what I call subjective scale. So these are not necessarily the same scale as the original photograph. So I'm very much thinking through the decisions that you make as an artist, like they're black and white photographs, almost all of them. So I don't really know what color these things are. I don't really know like exactly what the texture is, or in this case, what the wood that was used was. So I'm making these sorts of aesthetic decisions along the way. Um, this is a reenactment of a protest from Rome in 1947. It was against the then uh, Christian Democratic uh, Party. Um, it was a protest against the, the, the belief that the leader of the party was uh, working too closely with Washington. I mean, it's more, more history to that. But I thought it was an interesting photograph. I liked this puppet-like um, caricature that they made. And so I recreated that. But th in this sculpture, I sort of changed the methodology because I actually did change what was there. So I've transformed, I'm sort of bringing 1947, so some of the things I see in this photograph into alignment with my own situation in the United States in 2020. And I've transformed um, the, the original, uh, this is a uh, in the in the original photograph, there's a, a caricature of Premier Gasperi, and he's sort of transformed into Donald Trump here. And Donald Trump is being activated, sort of, if you will, by a mirror, which is his, in my view, his own sort of narcissism, <laughs> as opposed to the Gasperi is being activated by Wall Street in the in the original <laughs> photograph. Uh, oh, and he's he's been transformed into a swamp-like creature. So, so. All right, so um, in 2017, I did a project at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts based on working in their archives for uh, many months. And um, this work uh, was ended up being titled The City in Her Desolation. It was a group of uh, photographs and a large book and some prints and a uh, relief sculpture on the wall, which I'll show you in a second. It, it's almost invisible in this image. And the whole installation had to do really with this unbelievable story that I uncovered that was in the historical memory of the museum but had otherwise largely been forgotten about, um, which had to do with this sculpture um, that was uh, by William Wetmore Story, who at the time was a well-known American neoclassicist uh, sculptor who had been living in Rome. And he had been commissioned to make this work for this museum, okay? And this museum, the PAFA, uh, the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts is the oldest art academy in the United States. And in 1876, so the academy dates back to 1851, but in 1876, they opened a brand new building and it was literally in the press called a temple to art at the time. Um, and as part of the inauguration of this new uh, museum and art school, they commissioned the, the, the museum and some uh, patrons associated with the museum commissioned these two statues to be part of the inaugural ceremony. One is this statue of Jerusalem, which is called Jerusalem in her lamentation or desolation. And another one was a sculpture by uh, uh, Battisti called Deborah, which is the Hebrew prophet and judge Deborah. And well, I could spend hours just talking about this one story. I have to be uh, quick here. And I'll just say that there's a very fascinating story because these, both of these were commissioned in 1873, right? For the 1876, uh, you know, fest inauguration. And I uncovered the story where in, eight, in 1949, they decide, the, the institution decided that um, there was, they had too much work and they couldn't show it all. So they decided to deaccession a number of pieces and they got together this committee on collections and the committee uh, went around, went through the collection and chose a number of paintings and sculptures to be removed basically. And so what you see there is Jerusalem who has been in my words, definitely not the institution banished to a cemetery because she was given away to a local cemetery 
to a patron, a, a patron of the arts who, who took the sculpture away for the cost of its removal, basically. Um, Deborah did not, uh, did not fare so well. Deborah had, and what you're looking at there is a picture of a damaged sculpture because in 1937, a disgruntled employee ran through the institution uh, destroying art <laughs> and broke off her arm. She was re restored, but later could not be given away because the sculpture was damaged. So unfortunately, Deborah was, uh, the sculpture was destroyed, whereas Jerusalem was um, sort of banished. And so the, the installation of these, of the artworks that I made came to be really about this scene, you know, this, this metaphoric relationship between these women um, and these sculptures and the ways that the taste in art changes over time um, and the ways that the stories, of, uh, you know, change over time. Um, on the base of the Jerusalem sculpture was written in Latin was a quote from Lamentations. This quote here, which reads in English, how does the city sit alone when she was once so full of people? How like a widow is she who was once great among the nations and a queen among the provinces now become a slave? She weeps alone at night with tears upon her cheeks. All her lovers are gone and none can comfort her. All her friends have betrayed her and have become her enemies. And this text became very profound to me at the time. This is like, I'm working on this in like the summer of 2017 after um, Donald Trump had been elected and at a moment when there was a lot in the media about uh, the possible, you know, renewed nuclear hostilities with North Korea um, and about a lot of rhetoric about the United States um, isolation, basically. So it was very hard for me to, to read this story about this devastated city, right? Jerusalem, it comes from um, Jeremiah's, uh, or the author known as Jeremiah's witnessing of the destruction of the city in 586 BC and how the, you know, all of the citizens have, have been just destroyed basically, right? And this idea of like the city who's being personified by this female character who's distraught and destroyed and been left alone seemed to me as a kind of like amazing, um, just a reminder uh, that we don't, you know, that nations just like people don't exist on their own, right? And it's this isolationism is a dangerous idea. So the text was in, seemingly inscribed in the wall like some sort of monument, right? Uh, also, I, this is this is going to lead up into the work I've been doing here. Actually, is I created this book, uh, an accordion book that was style book that was about fifteen feet long, called "The City and Her Desolation." where I took this idea of um, the city destroyed and I, and I started to research images on the, just on the internet of all of the cities that ha have been destroyed, destroyed by warfare, basically for social reasons um, over many years or really uh, the, the parameters were sort of from the American civil war till today. And I, I made this collage of all of these um, images it just became one long kind of panorama of destruction. And a model for this, and this is where my knowledge and interest in conceptual art comes in, is Ed Ruscha, is this well-known American artist. And he did this piece called All the Buildings on the Sunset Strip in like, I guess, 1967. And uh, Ruscha's book shows the real estate, sort of, you know, the buildings on Sunset Strip, but it has this like white bar at the bottom with the address. Uh, the addresses of uh, of the buildings on it. So I sort of used this format for this work. Um, and these are just uh, details from the book. Um, I purposely don't include people in my collages of destroyed cities <laughs> uh, for ethical reasons and because I don't, yeah, mostly just don't think it's necessary. The center of this book, which 
I think we can see here is here uh, Hiroshima actually. It's a, so the center is really like the nuclear holocaust is like the the, gra the, the, the zero point, the vanishing point of the book. And no one city, you know, is given precedence over another, really. Um, so, like lots of you, and lots of you know, we, the, the, you know, the the pandemic was a difficult time for me to be creative. Um, I feel like two years just dropped out of my professional creative life, you know. Um, so many changes, so much anxiety, you know, it's like hard to be creative when you're stressed out all the time, even the most privileged people like of which I include myself. So one thing I did to try to manage with this, uh, to, to, to try to be creative in this period of time was I created this project, which you can still, it's housed on Instagram. You can still see it. It's like um, the account name is time moves in mysterious ways. And for a whole year, basically, from July 20th, 2020, to for the whole next year, every single day, I looked for a photograph online or in, I, a lot of these photographs come from the Library of Congress, um, but other places, um, either just on the internet or in a place like the Library of Congress. And I looked for photographs that somehow just struck me as being interesting um, for, for personal reasons, for, for whatever I was thinking about that day, this image would be interesting. And then I would write, this, so limitation of how much you can write on Instagram is about 370 words. <laughs> so I wrote a 370 word text basically about the, um, the image in relationship to whatever I was thinking about that day. So I will just um, share with you, do we have time? Yeah, we're good for it. So for example, this one is uh, the dis discovery of Pluto. This was February 18th. Uh, oh, I forgot the most important. So each day, the, 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 the photograph related to that day in history. Okay, so this is a picture from February 18th, 1930 that I'm then talking about on February 18th, 2021. So I wrote, on, for example, on this one, um, on this day, 91 years ago, young astronomer Claude Tombo found planet X in the sky by comparing photographic images for shifting objects, thus completing the life's work of the recently deceased Percival Lowell, Lowell, who set up the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona, for the purpose of that discovery. 11-year-old Venetia Burney suggested the new planet be named Pluto while sitting at the breakfast table with her mother and grandfather in the UK. Bernie's grandfather had been the head library at the Bodleian at Oxford, and he passed on the idea to astronomers there who called the Lowell Observatory. Pluto was not such a bad name. The Roman god, uh, the Roman god of the dead and the lord of the underworld known as Hades to the ancient Greeks, he was a master of ores, metals, and gems underground and thus controlled the wealth and the fates of mortals above riding around in a chariot with his three-headed dog, Cerebus, who guarded the entrance to the underworld, he kidnapped, he dispensed, sorry, luck here and there. His kidnapped wife, Prosperina, was not so lucky, snatched up by Pluto from the beautiful fields of Nisa to live in the underworld where she was desperately missed by her mother, Ceres. The latter gave rise to our seasons because Prosperina, who had eaten pomegranate seeds below, could only return to earth in the spring and the summer. Frosty winters aside, up in the sky, Pluto's reign has since been downsized by disgruntled mortals who since 2006 dare to call him a dwarf planet. And I look outside my window and I see the snow that Ceres brings each year, missing her loved one stuck underground. So that's just an example, but I did basically this every day, this type of thing, every, every day for the whole year. And it was quite epic, I have to say. Like it took me an hour to 90 minutes every day to do this. And um, I don't know what this is. I don't know if it's art exactly, but it's some, some kind of research. And um, it really was a delight. Like it kept me going for the whole year. And um, you'll see, you see in that um, shot there that 
when I couldn't do it, there were some days that I simply couldn't do it. And I substituted an Ankawara painting for that day on the days that I couldn't write anything. I, and so Ankawara, the great um, Japanese conceptual artist, um, was one of the influences for this, just this daily practice, right? I mean, but we could think about many more. Um, I'm also a big fan of this historian of American governance, uh, Heather Cox Richardson, who runs a letter every day that she calls letters from an American that tells us what's going on in today's politics in relationship to um, the history of the United States um, government, basically. And so these two things became kind of in, informing this. But here's the point. What, what I know, The bigger point here is through this year-long process, I discovered that I kept coming back to these aerial phenomena. I was really interested <laughs> in the aerial phenomena and the stories that uh, humans make up to explain aerial phenomena that they, they can't necessarily otherwise understand, which is why I wanted to show you this detail of Pluto. So this led me to thinking, I know this is going to be a, like a bit, you'll, it'll see it come together in a minute, but uh, I do have a degree in art history. And from my days studying art history, I've always loved the CNE school of painting. And one of the things I always loved about it is there are many, many pictures, this painter's many pictures of cities. Um, the floating orb in particular, the floating city, which I suppose has um, its origins in, uh, well, it has its, its, a lot of this painting has its origins in Franciscan thought, but also in Augustine's concept of like the heavenly city, right? The jewel, the Jerusalem is this, this heavenly kind of body. So I was thinking about like these aerial phenomena, these things in the sky and my long love of this kind of painting. And uh, this is one of the things I've been doing while I've been here is obsessively going around <laughs> taking photo after photo of as many of these pictures of these little cities as I can find in all kinds of frescoes and paintings in the museums and so on and kind of um, cataloging them. And because of my various interests having to do with cities, I really wanted to spend a lot of time with this well-known um, Ambrosio Lorenzetti fresco cycle here in Palazzo Publico, but it is closed for restoration. So I was so I'll have to come back. You have to come back. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so this leads me to this work that I've been finishing up while I've been here. This is a series that um, I'm calling City of God, or Cities of God, but each picture is titled after a specific city. And um, this work is now looking at cities that have been destroyed in natural disasters, archival pictures of cities destroyed by natural disasters. And I take those photographs and I, old school, I mean, I do it all digitally, so it's not old school really, but I, I, I cut the cities up and I take all the pieces, all the destroyed pieces and sort of rebuild them as a new city basically. And this is, uh, this is really important to the work is it looks like it's on some kind of spatial orb, right? But this is, and here I want to acknowledge my, a um, little bit of my partner in making these, my, my unofficial partner in making these photographs, which is a scientist called Scott Peterson. Um, Scott is part of a community of amateur and professional scientists who collect what these are. These orbs are called micrometeorites. And micrometeorites are um, meteor, teeny weeny weeny micrometeorites. And maybe um, Scott might be with us today. Maybe he'll he'll, he'll um, pipe up later. But he they have a system for collecting the space dust. Basically, it falls from the sky and it, it settles on the Earth. And these um, actually there isn't a detail here, but these are so small that it's like smaller than a grain of sand. So these pictures are actually scan electron microscope pictures that um, that I have uh, that I get from Scott with his permission, and these become these teeny weeny inceptible things from outer space become the place where the new cities are housed, basically. Um, oh, so this one is of the uh, is constructed out of images of the, San, the terrible earthquake in San Francisco, in 1906. 
This is another earthquake from Couture, uh, Montenegro in 1979. I just put the details there. It's they're hard to see otherwise. Um, this is New Orleans, 2005. This was uh, the, the, the flooding. And Haiti or Port-au-Prince in 2010. <clears throat> Um, these will be printed. I'm thinking about this as you know traditional kinds of artwork. So that, I mean they'll be they'll be printed and framed probably at kind of like a 25 by 30 inch kind of scale. Um, this one I made here. This is Sendai 2011, and this one there were so many boats <laughs> in Japan that had washed up. So this one's also got uh, it's, it's got a kind of city on the top, but then a kind of pile of boats in the bottom. And this one I made while I was here, which is uh, from China, Shijuan, 2008. So there's seven so far in this series and I had it in my mind that I would do seven. I'm not sure if I'm gonna do more or not, maybe. Um, I do enjoy making them. The backgrounds are um, from the NASA, uh, from NASA, basically. And okay, now I'm going to show you something really new that I've been doing. I don't even know what I think about this myself yet. You guys can tell me. Um, so I've been thinking about, you know, these kinds of palaces, right? And there's a lot here. Like, you, <laughs> you know, I went with Lisa and the students and I went again uh, with Hanan to uh, the Bikarinian Museum, which is just like an amazing archive, beautiful. And it's housed in the old, um, oh, is it Piccolomini Palace, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's just like you're walking through these spaces and you're thinking about this, like the incredible wealth that also functions as a patron for the arts in a lot of places. And I'm thinking about the structure of the city and that Siena is like a, it's like an amazingly preserved sort of city in a way. It's not like the cities that I, like I grew up in Frank, Vancouver, British Columbia, which was a kind of small regional city when I was a kid. And it turned into a place like Hong Kong over 50 years, like the transformation, you can't even imagine the transformation. And a lot of what I'm writing about are those kinds of urban cities. So this place, I've been thinking about it, like, why do I love this place so much? Because it's so different from that. It's so remarkably different from that kind of a city, you know? Anyway, I'm thinking about these, these kinds of houses and these places like the Palazzo Publico, which are also supposed to be sometimes houses for the people, right? Like the people's government in a way, the kinds of spaces of those. So I don't know, I had this intuition to, to look on the Library of Congress for pictures of Mar-a-Lago, which is Trump's you know, palace in Florida, <laughs> basically. And there's a, there's a huge collection of uh, copyright free, you know, images that um, the Historic American Building Survey produced in 1933 in Mar-a-Lago. Um, and they're kind of amazing pictures. So I thought, well, what happens if the war, and this is a different type of war, because I, this is just my opinion, but I think there's a lot of talk about a brewing civil war in the United States. And there's a lot of conflict, social conflict in the United States. And we had this, you know, January 6th insurrection recently, which was like people storming. It was citizens storming what we would call the people's house in a way, right? So it's a flip script. I'm thinking about like what happens if uh, those people are invited into Mar-a-Lago basically. Um, this title is very purposeful, House Beautiful, Bringing the War Home. It's actually an ode to a, a series of collages that the, the wonderful artist Martha Rosler made um, in the late 60s. And uh, in those collages, Rosler was showing the relationship between, you know, what is going on at home in terms of American consumerism of the 60s, which was an Afro, you know, well, or in the 50s is certainly an affluent period of time, but still like the kinds of design was being promoted in uh, the magazine House Beautiful. And she simply was collaging pictures of Vietnam War into this design magazine 
And in doing so, she's like just showing the relationship between the sort of, Amer you know, what some might call a kind of American imperialism with the consumption of the American market at home at the time. And so I like this, this title because I think it, it means something different in 2022, right? House Beautiful, Bringing the War Home. Like what kind of war is the artist me talking about here? What war is this, you know? And what, what's going on here? This is um, also the language like main entrance gate open is copied from the original Library of Congress photograph. So here's a few I've been making. You see the the QAnon shaman, the so-called QAnon shaman, forgot his real name, Jacob something at the back there. And sometimes they're kind of subtle. I don't know what I'm doing yet, but I, I'm kind of enjoying it. This one um, employs uh, liquidation sale. Uh, th th these liquidation sale um, photographs come or pieces come from um, the liquidation of Trump's casino in Atlantic City. <laughs> this one's kind of subtle too. It's like everyone's nightmare. <laughs> I think that might be, oh no, there's one more. This is a photograph I took myself of a truck in Pennsylvania. So mm. this is like <laughs> where I live. <laughs> yeah, uh, is that the last one? Yeah, oh, darn it, yep. So that's all I brought for you today, a little window into my world. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for, oh, I'm sorry, could you, let's just switch off the audio. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Great. So sorry for the technical glitches, but um, so thank you so much for this insight into your inspirations, your process, and also yeah. giving us a glimpse at some of your, your current work that's underway, because uh, I know sometimes it can be a little intimidating to show stuff that's very fresh and raw. Yeah, but it's funny because the work is like the new work doesn't seem to have anything to do with Sienna, but actually a lot of it is has emerged from just having time to think about things, you know, like. Oh, that's great. Well, um, we have a few questions from our online viewers, but I don't know if there's any questions from our, yes, from our in-person audience. I'm curious, why, why archives? Like, is it just the real discovery or is it some method of history that you're trying to preserving history, like a temporal thing? Like, what, what about the archives? Is, is this inspiring to you? Yeah, well, uh, very specific reasons. Like, there's certainly that. The real discovery. You discover stories that have been lost or just mislaid, maybe. <laughs> you know. But no, it's more about like the archives are the repository for history. Like um, there's other types of ways that we remember what has happened in the past, and some of those are actually uh, repertoires of embodied action, or that would be the lingo we use. But what that means is like oral histories, the way people cook, the way people dance, and so on. All of those cultural phenomenon are also ways that we remember history. But the documented, um, a lot of um, what is known about what happened in the past is held in written documents or ephemera of some sort. And yet, history is not um, objective, actually. <laughs> The archives are used to tell certain types of stories at certain periods of time. And so as an artist and just as a creative person, I'm really interested in, well, how can archives be used actually to tell different sorts of stories? Like some of the things that archives hold are not things that are um, talked about so much, you know, and there's precedents for this in the art world too. Like Fred Wilson is a very well-known artist who, American artist who, 
became known in the 90s for going into museum um, collections and just taking objects out that were generally not displayed because they were, uh, you know, maybe not uh, appropriate, like, and placing them in dialogue with other objects to, sh to show new kinds of stories, basically. So it's the archive is a social phenomenon. Yeah, and a social, an archive is something that's socially produced, just like everything else in the world. And so it's a, it's a wonderful place for um, intervention and for <laughs> different types of people to go in and um, to see what's there and to see what kinds of new stories can, that can be told. And it's always... How we understand history is always really, in my opinion, about what we think about ourselves today. Um, and so the archives are a place where we go to corroborate or to find conflict with, it, I think, what we think we know about, you know? Yeah. Does that answer that? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, one question uh, from uh, one of our online viewers who was um, asking, um, about the images we're showing of protests um, yeah. in different contexts, and was just asking, what can we learn from the repetitive, performative repertoire of this enactment of the demonstrations? Is there something about that, the idea of the repetitive nature that um, perhaps we can learn something from? I think so. I think it tells us, uh, well, there's, a, a couple of maybe ways to answer that. One is related to what I was just saying to Isaiah that like the ways when things are re, redone again and again, it, it's because they've been successful in carrying some sort of meaning forward, I think. And so I kind of like keep coming back to cooking, <laughs> I like cooking and dancing and things like this, like these kind of cultural forms are not only about bringing communities together about teaching something like cooking, for example, is about local ingredients. So it's about the environment that that action comes from. So on the one hand, it's not necessarily about protest, this part of the answer, but that's, that's a way of uh, a non academic or a sort of non sort of textual way of understanding um, the place that something is coming from. Um, an interesting thing I think about protests, like I was reading a lot about barricades for my book and the barricade is a very common political, it's like probably the most common sort of example of a political protest, right? It dates back to the um, to France basically and the barricades of France. And, and yet it was never successful. Like the military just came into Paris and just tore the barricades down in two seconds. Like it was, it became really important symbolically, but actually as a tact, as a military tactic, it wasn't very successful. And so, but what happened was the idea of the heroic partisan standing on the barricades was so, um, became so important as an idea that it circulated in books and literature for a long time afterwards. And so it's become really like a kind of super strong symbol of a kind of like resistance, even if as a tactic, it's not necessarily um, successful, which is not to say it's not ever successful. It's just um, originally it wasn't necessarily that successful. So um, I think that in some ways, like when you reenact something, a, a certain type of political protest, like I'm thinking about people congregating, like I went to the Women's March in the United States in 2017, people going to a site with all of these placards and banners. That's a kind of reenactment, but it also is something that's empowering for the people in the moment that are there. So it's, it's also about like creating a kind of like embodied power in the moment with other people, I, I think. It's just my opinions, I don't know. <laughs> Another question yeah. here, and on a very similar topic, um, I was also thinking about your bringing spatial art to protest specifically because I was also at the Women's March. Um, I'm from DC, so. Yeah. I was at the Women's March. Um, I was at several BLM movements of the pandemic. Um, I was thinking about the Pussy Hats specifically. Like people yes, great example. to protest um, as a symbol of, you know, whatever, and especially togetherness with Pussy Hats. Would you ever? bring or make your own art to protest? Do you think that's something you Yeah, possibly. I uh, 
haven't, I have, I, it, it's actually a question that's that come up before. Like what if these things that I made were like taken back out and <laughs> to be circulated? Um, I got more into thinking, I uh, kind of enjoying thinking about that with the, the, the later Trump one I did, which kind of functions as a puppet. It's like a, it's like a, um, Oh my God, that name, the word, a marionette. It's a kind of marionette basically that you could take in public space. Um, so I'm, I don't know. It just, it hasn't, um, there's something about the, the, the to use the example, the pussy hats that I really like that's like about, again, kind of creating community. So there's also a tension between, in all of my work, between what the artist does as an individual versus what a collective is able to do. Um, which I, I don't have a specific opinion about that. It's just like a tension that's always there. And I think the pussycat thing was really interesting because that's something that people were doing all the time and giving away. Like at the March, people were giving those hats away. Somebody gave one to me and I kind of treasure it today. Like it's because it's linked to the time and a kind of like solidarity that strangers were having with each other. That's also tied to the time spent literally knitting that thing, you know, which I think is, is a kind of like involvement in making something that's, I don't know if it's collaborative exactly, but sort of more collaborative in a way. I don't know. Yeah. Another question here. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm trying to understand um, as much as one can, uh, <laughs> not being a, an expert, where modern art is going. And it seems to me that, uh, Conceptual art and, uh, for example, your themes that you showed us are very clear in that the message has no worry about aesthetics. One does not go for beauty. And uh, this strikes me because art has always been also, in several ways, some a way of trying to make things beautiful, like Joseph's uh, uh, Bell Tower in Florence. Mm -hmm. which means, you know, I think it would be beautiful. beautiful. And uh, so my question is, don't you don't you find that there is something missing in uh, in all this? Don't, don't you yourself suffer or feel a sort of weakness on this side that what you do is not beautiful? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I'm so deeply engaged in, in this, this, like, because I. I feel so privileged because I have a life that allows me to think about things all the time. And that beauty for me is not just a, an aesthetic representation. It's also about like, like I don't necessarily have to make something beautiful myself. I see beautiful things all the time. And, I, and also I would disagree a little bit, like personally, uh, you know, but I guess you don't agree, but um, can I go back here for a sec? But I, th I think my micrometeorites are actually beautiful personally. So I'm going to say, so, okay, but maybe you don't, so that's fine. Um, but I'm just, I think art and culture, even in contemporary forms, is beautiful that it exists because it's a kind of, like, to me, it's, it's mind boggling that human beings created these things. Um, and so whether the, you know, the form of it changes over, over the centuries, right? So I can love something, um, like, for example, I wrote, I was wrote quite critically about Jeff Wall's artwork in my book, but at the same time, I, I can appreciate and marvel at the kind of photograph that, that this artist Jeff Wall created, which is a kind of conceptual photography in a way, or I can marvel at the kind of aesthetics of a row of gas stations on Sunset Strip in the 1960s, because that's a mod, that's a kind of modern aesthetic that is... So I'm, you're almost nostalgic for it today. I mean, not really, because do we need more gas stations? I don't know, I'm rambling a little bit. I just think there's so many different types of aesthetics, and your question to me suggests that maybe there's a, you have a specific idea of aesthetics, which I don't, I suppose, have. Yeah. Other questions? One more in the book there. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Um, I was thinking at the beginning, the list of themes that reappear in your work. One thing that I didn't see listed there, but did see uh, uh -huh. there, yeah. uh, things that touch on religion. Uh, here you're quoting from the Psalms, there's that gorgeous quotation. There. Yeah, that's kind of new over the last few years. And then yeah. the City of God. Can, can comment on, 
that? Yeah, well, I'm not religious at all, so I'll just say that. But I do think, like, this it actually gets back to the aesthetics comment in a way. Like, there's something profoundly comforting to me about the fact that, that uh, I also, I, I'm just going to segue, because, like, I didn't explicitly talk about the climate crisis, but that's really informing these micrometeorite pictures. Like, in my mind, the historical examples that I uncovered through this year of looking at all these photographs was uh, of people looking up at the sky to make sense of things often had a religious aspect to it. And often in the accounts I read, in order to inform myself about the micrometeorite pictures, I also read accounts of uh, people who had survived some of these disaster disasters, like the San Francisco earthquake or the um, Johnstown flood in Pennsylvania. And they were often, about they were they were religious exhortations for their either the, the 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 calamity happening like why did god do this to us or the survival thank god thank god for saving me kind of thing and so there's something about like the, the ways that uh religion and religious narratives have functioned for humans to make sense of the world that i while i'm not personally religious I, I think is a beautiful thing, actually. I find a lot of comfort in the fact that we, as a species, are so creative that we come up with these, these stories to tell ourselves to make sense of things we don't understand. And the climate crisis, um, the pictures I'm doing about the micrometeorites are like the scale of disaster. It's about different scales of disaster, right? Like, how do you make sense of your house being your town being totally destroyed by a flood or, or something like this is really personal to me too. Like this is affecting us everywhere. Since I moved to Pennsylvania in the last year, I've had to go hide down in the basement from tornadoes like several times. It never happened eight years ago. In the last year we've been down in the basement like three or four times. One tornado touched down for 12 miles in a strip, not too far from my house and destroyed like all of the tops of all of the houses that were there. I mean, this is like, it's not, it's present. It's a clear and present danger. <laughs> so how do you get your head around that, right? Um, and so there's something about the teeny, you know, the microscopic nature of this piece of dust coming from the universe, which is like, you know, we're from outer space or whatever. Like we can't get our heads around, I can't get my head around this the scope of the universe. It's a scale beyond my comprehension. And the climate crisis strikes me as a similar thing. Like there's a kind of used to use an aesthetic term, a sublime about the climate crisis. Like, um, how do you reconcile the scales of these disasters? You know, and that's really an underlying theme to those photographs. They also reference science fiction very purposefully. Science fiction is another, I didn't talk about it, it was another fabulous kind of genre of narrative that allows us to think about things in the future and, you know, try to get our minds around things in the future. So I'm not personally religious. I have great empathy for all of the different religious traditions and what, um, in a positive sense, they, they can teach us about, about things. Yeah. yeah. Well, we can, for our in-person audience, we can continue the conversation over some refreshments that we have out in our garden. Um, and for our online viewers, um, thank you all so much for joining thank us. Thank you. I'll just <laughs> mention, um, if you're interested uh, to, to look further into Leah Modigliani's work, um, she has a website, which is leahmodigliani.net, or you can also find her on Instagram, just lmodigliani, or as she mentioned, there's the, the special account for the Time Moves in Mysterious Ways project that she shared with us as well. So we hope that you all can also join us the same time next week when our presenter will be Hanan Kai, who's a graphic designer from Lebanon and one of our participants for this fall 2020 semester. So we hope you all can be back here next week. So see you then. Bye. Thank you.